are beginning a uh, cycle through the entire Bible, uh, not every last little bit word, but major sections of it throughout the year. And so uh, we begin in the book of Genesis, beginning uh, with the second chapter. If you want to follow along, we are on page two of your pew Bible. Uh, we are picking up in uh, at, uh, excuse me, Genesis chapter 2. I'm preaching from Acts for so long. Genesis chapter 2, uh, the second half of the fourth verse. Uh, if you look there, there's a little space that we're going to pick up right there. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One day, a girl that I was dating at the time looked me square in the eye, and she said, John, I like you at all, but if you're going to date me, you've got to go to church. Because I wasn't going at the time. Well, I went. We've been married now 32 years. <laughs> and I will be always grateful to Southeast Christian Church, the church that we went to in Salt Lake City. The Reverend Jerry Lewis was our pastor. Down the street of the Presbyterian Church was the Reverend David Crockett. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, those folks really made me feel right at home. And they had, they did. Anybody that came into that church was really made to feel welcome. And I, and I developed a love for Scripture that I really had not known before uh, while being a member of that church. And, and, I, and I, it's something that is still, it has grown deeper within me as the years have gone by. Um, and it is something which has held me in good stead because occasionally I come across things in Scripture that don't quite line up. And because I have this deep love of Scripture, and I believe that every word is true, that helps me when I encounter those things to perhaps ask myself the question, 
yes, but do I understand what truth is being said? And case in point, uh, there was a, a professor of a small four-year college. He taught uh, anatomy, introduction to anatomy for his class. And uh, they'd been meeting for some time. And the, uh, he asked, he had a couple of skeletons there, one previously belonging to a female and one previously belonging to a man. And they weren't using them anymore. And he asked the question, what is the major difference between the male and female skeleton? And the young woman raised her hand, and she said, well, the male skeleton has one less rib. He said, are you sure? She goes, oh, yes. Well, why don't you go count? So she went up to the two skeletons and she counted, and sure enough, they had exactly the same number of ribs. He goes, are you sure that one of these is a female and one of these is a male? He said, yes. Well, now the answer that he was looking for was the pelvic opening for childbearing was bigger on the female skeleton. But here in the Bible, in the second chapter, it says that God took a, a rib out of Adam. And I had heard that same thing, that because of that, men have one less rib. But, you know, it, it, the way I've been able to resolve that is consider, consider if you were to donate a piece of your rib. Maybe there was something in there generating the DNA or helping somebody develop the marrow from that or something like that. And you went into surgery. Because that's what God does. He performs surgery here on Adam. Uh, suppose that you had done that, and then after doing that, sometime later, uh, you had children. How many ribs would your children have? Would they have less ribs than you did when you first started out? No. Okay. So maybe this isn't about ribs. And then as I to develop the ability to read a little bit closer of Scripture in seminary, both the curse and the blessing. <coughs> what day were humans made on? Well, Genesis chapter 1 says the sixth day. It was the crowning achievement of all of God's creation. The sixth day, after everything else got made. But here in the second chapter, it says, wait a minute, before there were any plants in the field, before there was any of that, God created the man from the dust of the ground. And then all the other stuff came later. So maybe the point here isn't about days. I know that this is, I'm touching on a very touchy subject, and, I'm, and, and there were certainly folks that I knew there in that, that little church at Southeast Christian Church that held that the universe, or the creation, God did not create the universe of the earth at least until uh, about 4,000 or so years B.C., and, and hence it was only about 6,000 years old. There, there are folks that believe that. Um, I'm not here to argue about that. I wasn't there at the time. I don't know. But what I do know is, again, from the standpoint that there is a truth in here, how do I resolve this? And what I come up with is that primarily this section of Genesis is not about days, it's not about ribs, it's about relationships. Now, can you read the other stuff into it? Yes, that's a beautiful thing about Scripture. Different people can read it and get different things. In fact, you can read the same Scripture on a different day and pull something entirely different out of it. That's because it is Scripture. It is holy, and the Holy Spirit is involved in you reading it. But today I want to focus on this idea that what's really being presented here is relationships. It's first and foremost a relationship between God and humanity. God creates humankind the very last thing in chapter 1 because humanity represents the crowning achievement of all creation in God's eyes. Let us make man in our own image, he says, after everything else has been created. 
But it's also a relationship between humankind and the rest of creation. In chapter 2, mankind, we're not told the specifics of how man and woman were made in, in uh, Genesis chapter 1, but in chapter 2, God forms the first human out of the dust of the ground. That's about as intimately connected with the earth as you can get. But he does something else. There's no other creature who is also generated out of the earth and ground. He does something very unique with humankind. What does it do? He breathes into him the breath of life. So humankind is different from all the other animals, but you notice something here? All the other animals are also made out of the same earth. And so there's a relationship between us and all of creation. God says it's not good that the man, by the way, the name for man in the Old Testament is Adam or Adam. The name for earth, Adama. He creates for the man that there is no suitable help. So, God causes all these other animals to come, man, gives them names. None of them are suitable as a helper and partner. So what does God do? God doesn't reach down and grab more mud and make another human being. No, he causes this one human being to fall asleep and he pulls out a rib from the same substance of which this man has the same inspired the breath of God going into the same DNA, the same things where out of the front, out of the back, no, out of the side and creates for man a partner man says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. The word for woman is isha. The word for man here is ish. Which is a little interesting, because now man comes from woman. So there is a relationship also here between the genders between men and women. They are made of the same material. They are made of the same inspired, in-breathed breath of life. They are equals. They are partners and helpers. So you see how these relationships are? By the way, the name Eden means delight. They are placed in this garden of delight. There is a tree of life in this garden, and their job is to till the garden and to be each other's partners. And, oh, by the way, Gary, they have to be vegan because they can eat the plants. I'm just saying. relationship between the genders, perfect relationship between humankind and the rest of all of creation. The thing is, we know that that's not the way it is today. Humanity is divided from humanity. The battles between males and females The inequalities that exist, have existed. The enmity that exists between humankind and the rest of all of creation. 
I'll tell you what, there's nothing that can turn you into a ninja faster than walking into a cop. Nothing worse than that. Well, there are. And so often women have gotten the, the blame for the fall, but really, if, you know, <laughs> if Adam had actually told his wife about the, the fruit, sorry guys, I'm, I know, I know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you know, bros and whatnot. I'm not, a, I'm not sticking up for you, but if, if Adam had actually told his wife, don't eat that fruit, I don't think she would have eaten it. I won't swear to it. Sure. <laughs> you should know it's all our fault anyways by now. Guys, you've been married for a while. But after this, Paul says, Cursed are you, uh, greatly will I, well, this is the one, greatly, I will greatly increase your pains of childbearing, and with pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and you will rule over you. You see how it gets all broken up? We wonder, how is it that divorce can be such at such a high point, even among Christians and churchgoers? It's because it's broken. Our relationship, that primary relationship, that first relationship, is broken. He says to Adam, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded to you. See, guys, well, wait a minute. Biblical, we don't need to listen to our wives. It's right there. Right. But right. because we did, okay. right. <laughs> no, it's as cursed as the ground because of you, though. Through painful toil, you leave it. Oh, all of creation, this relationship with humanity, creation, that was broken. It's all broken. When we get painful news about our health, about the loss of loved ones, when we hear stories about the huge devastation which has just taken place here recently, It's a perfectly logical, understandable reason to question God's love for us. God, are you really in control? God, do you really love me? John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, God so loved the world that he sent his only son. What world? The, the world of the Garden of Eden? I'm sure he loved that world. But I believe he also loved the world that was so hopelessly broken that, as the Apostle Paul said, was groaning for the, 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 the revealing of the children of God, that he so loved all of this world that he sent his only son. Now, as a father, I cannot imagine sending a son to go into some place knowing that he was going to be abused, that he was going to be doubted, that he was going to be berated, that he was going to be betrayed and denied and ultimately killed. There's a great love which God has, a great desire to take things back into this relationship that existed so far and so long ago. And as further proof of that, I go back to Revelation. Again, I believe every word of the Bible is true. I don't fully understand the truth that it is trying to describe, but I accept that on faith. And, I, and, and, and when it comes to this part, the, the end of the story, where it's all going, the Revelator says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Thank God. I saw the holy city of New Jerusalem coming down. I heard a loud voice say, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. 
They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. I don't know when this is going to happen. Jesus says no one knows the day or the time. I simply believe that it is going to happen. And I believe that we can see glimpses of this in our own lives from time to time. That doesn't mean we're going to have clear sailing. Some of us are going to have more crosses to bear than what we can possibly imagine is even possible. But I believe that eventually where everything is winding down is God restoring everything back to the way it was. And I think we see from time to time glimpses of that in our own lives. People that have been released from mental illness, from slavery to addiction. Families being restored. People reaching out to complete total strangers who need a helping hand. People surrounding each other because they know what it means to be a community of faith. And they're not just scattered to the four winds when it comes 12.05 on a, on a Sunday morning, but to really do life together. To love each other and shoulder each other's concerns. I think we begin to see some of what is yet to come when we, when we encounter this. And all of this may sound rather trite. I'm not trying to be to be Pollyannish here at all. I'm not trying to, to just just you know do a, a bunch of 